Hello and welcome. Uh, thank you for joining me today. Uh, today we're going to uh, I'm going to discuss with you the old American dream versus the new American dream. If you're not familiar with um, my typically what I talk about, I uh, definitely recommend that you subscribe and start uh, checking out some videos. Typically, I talk about reaching the finish line and how to help people uh, reach that next level uh, in their life. Uh, more videos there. Just subscribe and click the bell notification and you can stay tuned uh, by um, with, with new weekly videos. So, you know, when I grew up, you know, when I, I was I was I was born and raised in uh, North Philadelphia, uh, actually in a neighborhood called Swamp Poodle. <laughs> as as awful as that sounds, it's like Swamp and Poodle. It's like a dirty dog. It sounds awful, you know, for for the name of a neighborhood. But that's the neighborhood that I I was born in. I was born in a neighborhood. I was raised there for for a while, and I thought as a kid that I lived in the best country in the world. You know, you know, for me, you know, I thought I thought, wow, this is as good as it gets. You know, I used to remember watching uh, television and, you know, these commercials and they show you that all this poverty in other countries, you know, like, uh, you know, Southeastern Asian countries, uh, and African countries, uh, as well as uh, Latin American countries. And for me, I guess, not for only for me, but for you as well, you know, I always thought that, well, you know, African people are poor, South Asian, Southeast Asian people are poor, Latin American people are poor. So I, I'm in the best country in the world. You know, of course, I didn't have, I, yeah, I wasn't, you know, as a child, we are all are naive. We don't know a lot. We're not very educated, you know. So uh, that's what I initially thought. Moving forward, going to middle school, going to high school, you know, I still had that same belief. And you know why? Because, you know, my education in a sense was limited. And, I, and my focus at that time, like any other teenager, is, you know, evolving their identity, you know, trying to be the cool person in high school or at least or at least or at least just being comfortable with your your evolving identity or discovering yourself uh, in high school. So. At that time, I had aspirations to be. Uh, a rapper and then a basketball player. And, you know, I think, I think that's a lot of uh, uh, specifically even uh, ethnic minorities. That's, that's when they're that young, they typically aspire to those things. There's nothing wrong with that, you know? And then we have our parents, you know, or friends of family, our friends, you know, always telling us that, you know, <laughs> before we become an adult, they tell us that we can do absolutely anything we want to do. If we put our mind to it, we can do anything. OK. And it has, and we believe that, you know, as teenagers, we believe that, that we can be anything, you know. Uh, unfortunately, uh, <laughs> as as. As, as we become adults, we realize that that's not exactly the whole picture, okay? So when I uh, graduated from high school, you know, I went to university and all that, and, uh, you know, I graduated, but unfortunately, what the university tells you, how much you're going to make and what you actually make in the real world is always different. Most of the time, it's typically different. You know, maybe if you go to maybe uh, Ivy League school, maybe, 
maybe you'll maybe you'll make that amount of money. But it's not necessarily because that's what the workforce pays. It's because of the network that you make in these prestigious universities. OK, so let's start with, you know, the original meaning of the American dream. And uh, I'll be referring uh, to a, a few notes I made, but the, the American dream was initially coined by an author. Uh, his name was James Truslow Adams. And uh, he wrote a book called Epic of America. And in his book, he described it as uh, that dream of a land in which life should be better, richer, and fuller for everyone with opportunity for each according to their ability or achievement. Okay. Now, he was he was the first person to coin that, but you know, as you know, as we had you know President Roosevelt and all of these presidents after him, uh, basically, my grandparents aspired to that. My parents aspired to that, and that's what everyone thought they were going to have. Um, there was an interesting soci sociologist. Uh, her name is Emily Rosenberg, and. Uh, she identified uh, five components uh, of the American dream. And I thought that was very interesting. And she, and she said uh, the belief that other nations should replicate America's development. And that's one thing I have seen not only as a young, young person, but also an adult. People always say, well, why can't they just do it our way? Like the like the U.S. way is the only is like, like it's the better way. Like there's no there's no other way it can be improved. It has to be the U.S. way. Which you know. Secondly, she said faith in a free market economy. Third, she said support for free trade agreements and foreign direct investment. Uh, and that's interesting because in the last part. Many people don't know, but uh, America, uh, the U.S. actually offers a uh, a green card in a way that you can pay for. A lot of people don't know that, but you have to be rich. It's something like I think it's called the EB five visa, uh, but it's something like a little over a half a million dollars. And you and you invest that money, and you create jobs, and you keep that going for about five years, and they give you, in the U.S. gives you permanent residency. Okay, so uh, that that plays that plays a part. The fourth is promotion of a free flow of information and culture, and lastly, acceptance of government protection of private enterprises. That's one thing that. Uh, a lot of businesses appreciate uh, as far as having these regulations to uh, protect themselves and to have more stability uh, in their uh, businesses. So uh, that was initially uh, what we aspire the American dream, uh, or what we aspire as the American dream. For corporate, for, for, for people, you know, you, you might have heard a common saying of, uh, a house with a white picket fence, you know, having a car uh, and plenty of disposable income uh, to take care of family of four. You know, well, as we're going to discuss, that has changed. Now, the advantages of the American dream, um, uh, that at least that we were led to believe was, you know, political and economic freedom. Well, if we look at the political fr freedom, we know that that's not really the case. That's not true. Uh, there's two political parties and they have this organization that shuts out all other political parties from being heard. So you could be on the ballot in your state, 
but you can't get into the debates because the debates are only for uh, Democrats and Republicans. So the political freedom, unfortunately, that's not that's not 100 percent true. Economic freedom uh, that varies uh, because there are many parts of the country where the income inequality is huge and other parts of the country where there is in income equality, but at a significantly less rate. And there are a few areas and where more or less you can say uh, that it is even. Other advantages, the rule of law, private property rights, uh, and, and so forth. Another thing uh, is people believe is that the American dream promises uh, freedom and equality. Now, to a limited, it, 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 to, to a certain extent, it does. You know, like for example, you know, I walk out the store and I have a right to choose the grocery store that I want to go to. And I'm going to pay the same price in a grocery store, uh, whether I'm black, white, Christian, Muslim, you know, you know, I mean, of course, there, there are some fundamental uh, uh, equal rights that everyone has in the United States. But as I as I pre, as I mentioned briefly, there are things, uh, fortunately, like uh, income inequality or or things or things like uh, uh, re religious equality or things like p political equality. Uh, as I talked about the political parties and religion, uh, some some unfortunately some religions are not more are not as accepted in certain parts of countries than other religions are. Those are the things that people believe. Well, you know, if I immigrate to America, this is what it's going to be like. Unfortunately, uh, it's not it's not as, it's not as simple as that. Okay. Now. Obviously, one thing that uh, one thing that uh, many Americans appreciate is the rule of law. You know, if someone breaks into my house and I call the police, in most cases, the police is going to come. The police is going to come. The police is going to file a report. Um, the police is uh, going to work on my behalf. Uh, to deliver justice, you know. After all, we're all paying. After all, Americans, most well, most Americans are paying taxes. Uh, Americans that are working, Americans are paying taxes, and that's what they expect from their uh, uh, from 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 these public services. Another thing is, if I want to file a lawsuit, whether it's because of a company or because of another individual, I have a right to do that. And, and the process is straightforward, you know, and through the courts, a person can get justice. There's there's many examples like that and where the U.S. does a very good job uh, of that. So, you know, I, I, I'll, I, think, I think it's worth mentioning. So. That's where. Uh, I guess let's say the American dream is now. Uh, I'm going to talk about, or sorry, let me rephrase that. That's where the American dream was uh, uh, then and even up to now to a certain extent. Now let's talk about to where it has gone and if, you know, what, what it has become uh, nowadays. Okay, so we're going to, we're going to, I want to talk about this American Enterprise uh, Institute report. Uh, it's called the American Dream in 2020. Did a very good report. And for any comments and questions, I'm going to take that towards the end. Okay. So be happy if you have any comments or questions. We could discuss that in the end. So the 2018 um, OECD report that's mentioned in this report stated that. Uh, uh, the percentage of children earning more than their parents is becoming less and less and less and less. You know, in 1940, uh, there was a 90% chance that their children was going to earn more than their parents. Lifetime versus lifetime. Okay. Uh, in 1960, 
uh, that number decreased to 65%. 65% of the children was going to earn more than their parents during their lifetime. Uh, and then we also look to 1976, 77, that's off decrease again. Only 55% of children will earn more than their parents in their lifetime. And then uh, 1985, uh, it has gone to 50% and it, it goes lower and lower and lower and lower. And unfortunately, you know, despite what we believe as the American dream, that seems to be the ever growing reality. More and more uh, generations are making less money in their lifetime than their parents in the United States. <clears throat> the report finds that the average OECD, so if you don't know what OECD is, basically it's, uh, I believe it's the Organization of Economic Community Development, and it's basically a culmination of developed countries, countries like US, UK, Australia, uh, uh, Canada, so forth, okay? They have found that the average, uh, they have found that in the U.S., it takes a child from a poor family five generations to reach the national income. So that's not, that's not, that's, that's all people, okay? So it doesn't matter if you're black, doesn't matter if you're white, doesn't matter if you're, you're Latino, that's all people, okay? So I thought so I thought that was uh, that was quite interesting. And another thing was, it seems that uh, forty percent of individuals with low educated parents have lower education themselves. You know, so typically maybe if your parent, my, my parents only had only have a high school diploma. My mother has a high school diploma. My father has a high school diploma, and. In those cases, 40% of the time, children will only uh, attain the same amount of education that their parents did. They will only have a high school diploma. Only 10% uh, uh, actually uh, continue uh, in getting, oh, actually I, I misquoted that. 40% of individuals have lower level levels of education themselves. So 40% of individuals have lower education uh, 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 than their parents, okay? And only 10% uh, goes on to university, which means that the other 50% has as much education uh, as their parents. You know, I was fortunate uh, to go uh, to university uh, and I, I graduated. It took a little longer than I, I, I initially uh, planned, uh, but I, uh, I graduated uh, and, uh, but we're gonna talk more about Having a college degree doesn't necessarily make you successful or will make you successful uh, in the long term. Okay. All right. So we'll go to the next slide. Give me one moment. Okay. Let's go to the next slide. So, there was something called the Great Recession that I'm sure that everyone uh, was familiar with. And unfortunately, a lot of people did not exactly recover fully from the Great Recession. Actually, uh, that same American Enterprise Institute report found that only 20% of the country actually fully recovered from the recession. So it is showing that 80% of the rest of the country maybe only recovered 50%, maybe only recovered 70%, maybe only recovered 85%. But the truth is no one fully recovered. And the problem that's happening now is every recession that we're going into, whether it's whether it was the dot com bubble in 2000, or whether it was the Great Recession, or whether it's the cold COVID recession, every recession that we're going into, and for me, this is the third recession I'm in uh, as as a as, as an American. Every recession that we're going into, less people 
are recovering from are, 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 are having are, are making less financial recovery. So maybe after the Great Recession, you know, people only recovered, let's say, 75, 80 percent financially. But now that we are in COVID, which uh, which is essentially uh, 10 years or 12 years later, that person now went from 75 to 80 percent now to 50 percent. So actually, they haven't recovered from the past recession and this recession has actually created more damage, you know? So unfortunately, uh, that's something that uh, we are seeing uh, more and more. There's places like Ohio uh, and where, you know, there's, there's high unemployment, there's high underemployment, as well as other places across the country facing these high unemployment un underemployment rates. And it's because that a lot of industries moved out, moves out of Ohio, move out of these Midwestern areas, move out of these mountain uh, areas uh, for better pastures. And, you know, you can't necessarily, it's not the business fault, you know, because the business wants to find a way to, you know, continue to make business. But as a result, uh, the worker class, uh, it has unfortunately, uh, has hurt them tremendously. Okay, let's go here. So, I'm going to kind of bring this to a close because I actually took much longer than I than I intended to. Okay, but I want to focus on this interesting report by uh, the National Low Income Housing Coalition. You know, they're an organization in the U.S. and basically they focus specifically on uh, housing costs and affordability nowadays for Americans. And I think this is very important because in some areas, 35 to 40 percent of your income is housing. You know, if you're fortunate and you own a house, well, that makes things a, a lot easier, you know, you know, or, or, you know, or, or if you, if you inherited, you know, if, if, if you're inherited a house or your, your parents let you stay in a house or, or if, if there's any way that you can avoid a monthly rental cost, you're more fortunate, but 35 to 40% of people uh, have to allocate that amount of income towards rent. Okay. And unfortunately, um, it's not going to improve. It's actually going to get worse. So uh, the, the, the report uh, is an estimate of the hourly wage full-time workers must earn to afford a rental at fair market rent without spending more than 30% of their income. Okay, so again, 30 to 40 percent is typically allocated to a uh, person's housing expenses. Okay, fair market rents are estimates of what a family moving today can expect to pay for a modestly priced rental uh, in a given area. Okay, so the federal minimum wage is unfortunately 725. Now, that's very low, and unfortunately, uh, it has not kept up with the pace of inflation. I mean, you know, even though that federal minimum wage hasn't been updated, a lot of states and a lot of uh, counties uh, have uh, increased their local uh, minimum wage. Uh, so that way residents could have a more uh, affordable cost of living. So, Since uh, the federal minimum wage hasn't kept pace with inflation, uh, actually the federal minimum wage is worth 30% uh, less uh, than what it was worth in 1968. Um, but, you know, I know that most people don't make minimum wage. You know, most people might make 50 cents more, a dollar more, $2 more, $3 more, whatever. 
Okay. But I do speak to this specifically because I know during this COVID pandemic, a lot of companies have been taking advantage because they they see, well, oh, okay, people are desperately in need of a job. So they have a huge supply of applicants. Uh, and the demand of finding applicants is lower because they can essentially they have a huge reserve of, uh, of they have a huge reserve of an applicant pool in which if one person if they fire one person there's 25 other people who would be happy to take their job even if it pays eight dollars and 75 cents okay but the struggle to afford rental housing is not confined to minimum wage workers uh, the average the average renter's hourly wage uh, of eighteen dollars and twenty two, eighteen dollars and twenty two cents, uh, is five dollars and seventy five or, or one dollar and thirty four cent less than the housing wage it will require from a one bedroom apartment, and five dollars and seventy five cents of the housing wage it will require for a two bedroom apartment. So, you know, the government did uh, do do these uh, what they call housing uh, moratoriums in which that landlords wasn't able to kick out people. Uh, and, and, and that did help to a certain extent, especially during the pandemic. Uh, but the truth is, even when the economy was more or less normal, Many people had difficulty affording apartment, affording an apartment with just a regular job. People have to people. Unfortunately, there's more and more of these programs that's called um, low income housing programs or or rent resistant programs, essentially where you pay a certain amount and then the government pays the rest of the amount. You know, there's nothing wrong with that, uh, obviously, but. Uh, fortunately, you know, if the country comes to a point where everybody has to be on a program like that, then obviously, you know, there, there's huge concerns in those dynamics of the economy. Okay, let's go to the next slide. Uh, so. You may ask, okay, you said all of this, I know a lot of this, but what, what's your point? Okay, and that's the purpose of this video, is the new American dream. Uh, certain people are living alternative lifestyles in the US, you know, ways in where they can save significantly more money, ways in where uh, they can have more of a flexible lifestyle. Like for example, uh, you may have heard of the FIRE movement, which is financially independent, retired early. And they basically save 65 or basically 50 to 65 or 70% of their income so they can retire early. But you may ask, how can a person, how can a person actually do that? You may ask, how can a person actually do that? Uh, you know, unless they have a very high paying job. Well, so, well, well, some people have been living alternative lifestyles and people in where uh, they may live out in the woods, in a cabin, you know, but maybe not too far from a big city where they have internet, but they can dramatically reduce their rent. Some people do that in the US. I follow a few YouTubers who actually, well, I watch a specific YouTuber uh, who actually does that. Uh, there are other uh, people who live in these nice uh, travel trailers. Uh, essentially, I actually did a video about that. Um, I recommend that uh, you check that out. Actually, I'll, I'll post that in the comments. Uh, I don't know how to do it here. Uh, still kind of new to this whole live streaming with YouTube. So, but there are people who, who have these, who, who buy these nice travel trailers and yeah, they may pay, for example, they may pay 10, 15, $20,000, but they don't have to pay rent ever again, because essentially all they're paying for is 
gas because they have to tow it and potentially the property that they can put it on. If, 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 if they buy a cheap, let, if, they, if they buy a cheap plot of property that costs them two thousand dollars, well, it's the cost of the travel trailer plus the cost of the plot of property, and that's it. You know, eventually they'll make their money back, but they won't have. But once they break even, they won't have to pay rent for uh, the rest of their lives. Some people go even more frugal. They live. They live in a van. You know. I would, you know, that's not something I would do, but, you know, my whole point is people are looking for alternative lifestyles to get out of this financial squeeze that they're in, in the U.S. You know, some people are fortunate, maybe the parents have an extra house and they can stay with, and they can stay at their parents' extra house or maybe people with roommates and maybe the roommate situation works well or whatever, or maybe some people live with their parents. You know, the whole point is, the whole point is more people are finding alternative lifestyles in the US so they can at least realize a new American dream. You know, overall, whether you live with roommates, whether you live in a travel trailer, whether you live with your parents, at the end of the day, people want to save more money because essentially people want to either have more disposable income, you know, and still have a great lifestyle, but just sacrifice that they have to live with roommates or parents. Or it appears now from what I'm seeing that more people are saving a lot of money because they want to retire or at least semi-retire. They don't want to work for the rest of their lives, you know. And, and, and nowadays, nowadays, there's nothing wrong with a job, you know. Uh, many jobs are, at least, with, at least with the startup culture, are trying to create more welcoming and more accepting um, uh, work cultures. But... The truth is, when you take a job, your boss can be replaced and maybe the boss that you once loved. Now you have a boss that you hate and then you have to deal with that. I've heard many stories about that, which is personally the reason why, you know, that's that's that's, you know, I that's not my preferred uh, uh, work style. OK, so. There are some people who are fortunate and they have a great job in the U.S., and they don't have to worry about this specific topic that, uh, that you know, as far as not having enough. However, there's one thing to keep in mind. There's something called the law of impermanence, which, which, which is what's going well for you is not permanent. And what's not going well for you is not permanent. You know, so even though things may be going well for you, you have to realize that things can change at a moment's notice. And you have to realize even though things are going the things may be going bad for you, things will also change eventually. And, and this is why, you know, if this is not something you incorporate in your life now, it's what I recommend that you incorporate uh, or, or, or at least consider or start considering, maybe start planning for uh, in the very uh, near future. Now, there are a lot of these um, Black, you know, there, there are a lot of these, um, uh, I guess, expatriating, more expatriating across the U.S. Uh, some people, uh, some people are renouncing their, their their citizenship, you know, because, you know, for them, you know, they don't like the heavy taxation and they want more freedom elsewhere. Uh, you got other people uh, who uh don't like the way they're being treated, you know, you know, for example, uh, you know, if you if you if you are of a certain race, a race like mine or a race like someone else, uh, maybe in a specific area that you live in the U.S., maybe you don't feel like you are being treated well. You know, maybe if you go somewhere else in the U.S., you will be treated well or maybe you won't. Who knows? OK, but uh, also a, a lot of people have been doing that because they also want to have a higher quality of life. They want to make more. They want to be able to save more money, invest more money. And maybe they just want to start their, they want to start their journey of retirement in a different country that accelerates their ability to do so. And this is the reason why, if you have been watching my videos, I have been a big supporter of, um, uh, minimizing your cost of living and maximizing uh, 
your quality of life. And that's also a video uh, that, will, that, that will also uh, include in the comments. I have been living in Mexico for 2015 initially for a year. And then I came back in uh, the back towards after the summer, the fall, more or less, of 2018. And I've been here ever since. Okay. Um, now, Mexico, and of course, you don't have to pick Mexico. You can pick whatever country you want. Maybe you like the Caribbean, maybe you like Europe, or maybe you like whatever country, it doesn't matter, okay? Just talking about my personal journey. I picked Mexico uh, because uh, Mexico has the largest uh, number of American expats than any other country in the world. So more Americans, besides the US, more Americans live in Mexico than any other country in the world. It's close, you know, it's a short flight. Uh, you can still buy things, buy particular things and get them shipped here. But one thing that I have realized is overall, it's a better quality of life for a lower cost of living. There are exceptions, but keep this in mind. Okay, typically you'll pay, I don't know what you pay for a two bedroom apartment. I know some people pay $2,000 a month. I know some people pay $1,600 a month. I know some people pay $1,400 a month, okay, for a two bedroom, or a two bedroom apartment or even a one bedroom apartment, okay? Somewhere between 1,000 and 2,000, okay? Maybe, maybe for a one bedroom apartment, if you're lucky, because there are some cities in the US, maybe like Tucson or, <clears throat> or like Cleveland, uh, where you can pay seven or you can pay six hundred dollars for one bedroom apartment. But in most cases, uh, you're going to be with all. That means your rent and your utilities. Okay, you're going to be between one thousand and two thousand in most cases. Okay. In other countries, uh, you can pay significantly less. Here in Mexico, uh, I am staying uh, in a two-bedroom house, okay? It's a two-bedroom house, um, and I'm trying to do the conversion between pesos to dollars. I am paying, I would say more or less, I am paying a, a bit under a bit under $500, okay? So maybe like 480, you know? I, again, the conversions always change, the currency the currency conversions, but more or less, let's call it $500, okay? It's a little less, but $500 for a two bedroom home uh, here in Mexico. I live in Medida uh, right now uh, with my girlfriend. And um, the truth is, uh, anywhere in Mexico, you'll probably pay that amount. I mean, maybe if you live on the beach, you're going to pay a little more, but, uh, 500 to 500 to, uh, let's call it 1,200 is probably what you're going to pay, uh, for a two bedroom apartment and you'll pay even less for a one bedroom apartment. OK, there's there's something that people always wonder when it comes to other countries is the safety. OK, uh, people, people would say specifically Mexico, they think about cartels, they think about kidnappings and all of that. And, you know, and typically uh, uh, Latin America tends to have that negative stereotype. Well, I've been here f almost what I've been here f almost four years. And unfortunately, I haven't been kidnapped or I haven't, no one has stuck a gun in my face or I haven't had any of those uh, negative in interactions. Now, uh, I did lose something. Uh, it was petty crime uh, here in Latin America. I wasn't there. Uh, someone stole something from me. Uh, however, I've also been stolen from and robbed 
uh, petty crime, same thing, when I was in the United States. So, you know, to me, uh, uh, a lot of Mexico is as safe as the United States. Uh, when it comes to food, uh, food, you can essentially, um, you know, it doesn't matter if you eat organic or vegan or, or, or whatever, whatever your diet is, okay? Uh, there's grocery stores uh, that, uh, it, there's especially grocery stores that have those specific, that sell those specific foods. Um, and you can continue, you can continue your diet as you normally would in the United States uh, here in uh, Mexico. Okay, so my whole point of all of this is to show you that the American dream, uh, the new American dream, can, it, it can be attained in the United States, but it is significantly more difficult. Okay, because I said before, every recession, it gets worse and worse and worse for most people. Not everybody. Now, maybe you're watching this, you, you haven't been affected. But overall, every recession, which is typically has been now, every, every 10 years, every 10 to 12 years, uh, it gets worse and worse and worse economically for most Americans. They have less disposable income. They have more credit card debt. I know I'll add to use their credit cards because their full-time job could not pay for all of their expenses. I've seen that more than once, you know, and, and where, and where, you know, some, somebody makes 12, somebody makes 12 or $15 an hour, 12 or $14 an hour, and they still have to use their credit card to pay for 10, 10 to 15% of the necessary expenses because that job doesn't cover, you know, it could be maybe, maybe the state income tax is high or whatever it is, but no one should have to use a credit card because their job doesn't pay enough. You know, to me, you know, that, that's, that's mind boggling. But the new American dream can be attained in the US, but it is becoming significantly more difficult. However, the new American dream can be attained if you look beyond your borders. Maybe this is not something you're ready to do right now. That's fine. But maybe this is something you can start considering to do in, in a year, possibly in two years. Okay. Uh, this is the reason why I have chosen to live here in Mexico. You know, just think about this. As one person, okay, I'm one person, obviously, <laughs> but as one person, you know, I told you my expenses. Well, I told you my rental, okay? So if the food, food expenses is about, I don't know, let's call it with the, cur with the currency uh, conversions, let's call it $300 a month, okay? And this is for two people because I live with my girlfriend, okay? So $300 a month, okay? And healthcare here, you know, you can go to any pharmacia. So a lot of the pharmacies here have doctors on site and they do everything that they would do if you went to a clinic or hospital. They check your blood pressure. Uh, they tell you to lay on the table and they check your heart. And again, all the things that you would expect in the US, most of that is done here. And for a consult with a doctor, Maximum, you'll pay, what, $5? Maybe in some more private places, you'll pay $10 for a consult versus a consult in the U.S. where you're going to pay at least $100. You know, unless you have, uh, unless you have, unless you have, uh, uh, unless you have, unless you have your health care through your company, uh, through the, your employer, rather. You know, there are so many uh, benefits. It's just like to do leisurely activities here, again, much cheaper to eat out here, much cheaper. Uh, for me, it just makes sense. I knew that if I live in the U.S. today, I will live an OK lifestyle without working. Yeah, I'll live an OK lifestyle. Uh, but obviously, I can live a better lifestyle here 
Well, okay. Let me rephrase this. When I say without working, I mean without working for like like okay, McDonald's or Walmart or like an employer like that. You know, I, I'm not no trust fund baby or a person that inherited a million dollars. Okay, so <laughs> just wanted to clarify that here. But I wouldn't have to take a Walmart job or a McDonald's job or anything like that. You know, yeah, you know, you know, I I could with my assets like book royalties. The things that have been creating passive income for me, uh, book royalties, among other things, things that you do one time and it continues to sustain you. Uh, I could live an OK lifestyle in the U.S., obviously, although living living in a place like Latin America or Southeast Asia. Um, not only me, but you as well can live significantly uh, better. So I just want to, um, I know I haven't, I haven't been checking the, U, the, the YouTube stream, uh, but I just want to, uh, or yeah, okay, let's go back. I just want to uh, share that uh, with you because it's my intention for you to reach the finish line. You know, I say all that to say this. It doesn't matter um, the current situation that you're going through, because at the end of the day, we all have a choice. OK, so whether it's politics, whether it's the economy, uh, 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 you know, whatever, whatever type of whatever you're going through you can always make a choice. There's always a choice in everything nowadays. And I want you to choose to start reaching your finish line. Now, your finish line can be whatever that is. I always say, I've, I've always said uh, reaching the finish line, but essentially what it is, is for you to achieve your goal is for you to reach the next level and whatever that is. And maybe once you reach that finish line, maybe you might set another finish line, you know, but the point is, is to get you there. And uh, my intention is to help you get you there, whether it's personally uh, in your personal life or whether in your professional life, uh, I want you to reach the finish line. I've written two books about this specific theme um, that I advise you to uh, check out. Uh, one book is actually being updated. The first book I wrote, that's being updated as we speak. And if you send me an email at contact, contact at reachingthefinishline.com, uh, you can request a pre-order. And uh, I'll be happy to see you uh, the pre-order page where you can pre-order the book. And you can be the first person to not only get the book, but you'll get the book at a, a discounted price as opposed to once it goes out to the public. That's going to be uh, reaching the finish line, the practical guide. And if you want to pick that up, just uh, send me an email with this with the subject line pre-order and uh, at contact, send, uh, send me an email at contact at reaching the finish line dot com with, with the subject line pre-order and uh, requesting the book, the, the, uh, the updated edition, and I'd be happy to get that over to you. I've written a second book called Reaching the Finish Line, How to Thrive in the Generation Y Era. So I've been talking about this topic for a very long time. And wherever you're at in your life, you can reach the finish line. It just seems that when it comes to Americans, it just seems that at this specific point in time and where people do not have a lot of... Um, uh, savings. Uh, a lot of people are dissatisfied with their job. A lot of people are underemployed. Uh, a lot of people are unemployed. I think living in another country can be one of your better options. Maybe overall you may not choose that, but I think it could be one of your better options. Uh, you can work remotely. Uh, for uh, a U.S. company or maybe any other company, uh, maybe you're from Canada or you're from the U.K., you can work for a Canadian company or uh, a, a British company and 
and they can you can work online from Mexico or from Thailand, and they put the money in your account. But now you're in a country where your expenses your expenses is significantly less. So um, that's something uh, that I uh, that's something I want you to keep in mind, especially you know because to be honest, I don't think that we're going to go or the U.S. Uh, is going to go back to normal. I think it's going to take much longer uh, than, than they think. Uh, and, and, uh, and, you know, what, what I found interesting is uh, during this time, I have seen more, uh, more uh, Americans than ever here in Mexico because I think they understand that. Maybe some people were just coming to visit for a vacation, but I strongly believe that a large percentage of those, uh, of those extra, of those new faces were people who decided to at least test drive the, the expat lifestyle. You know, maybe they stay here for a month, two months, three months, but you know, as a foreigner in most countries, you're not going to have any problems. Okay. Only thing you're going to have to do if you live in a Spanish speaking country, you're going to have to speak Spanish unless you want to live in a few areas and where you don't have to speak any Spanish, you can speak all English, but that's going to be a bit more expensive. Places like Cancun, places like uh, La Paz, Los Cabos, uh, San Miguel de Allende. Those are places here in Mexico uh, where, yeah, if you don't want to speak no Spanish, no problem, but you're going to pay more. It will still probably be less than what you'll pay in the U.S., but you're still going to pay more, you know. For me, you know, there's, there's a lot of courses, um, there's a lot of courses that you can take uh, online, free courses. Uh, that way you can start, you know, uh, learning some Spanish. All you need to know is the basics and that will actually take you a long way. You know, I think a lot of people feel intimidated by learning a language and uh, their, their uh, lack of ability to transition, adapt to a new country. If you know the basics, you know, you'd be surprised. All right. Well, let me see if, if you have any questions or comments, you can post it right now and I'll be happy to get to it. But yeah, we're, I'm about to wrap this up. Um, but yeah, if you have any questions or comments, you can post it right now. Be happy to address them. Uh, but I hope that was helpful. I really hope that was helpful uh, because the only positive thing that uh, I have seen during this recent uh, pandemic recession was that more businesses were created during this pandemic. But I want to add a little clarity on that. And I'll do that until I see some questions. Yes, more, the, the more businesses were created uh, than in previous years due to the recession. But that doesn't mean that these businesses are successful. You know, I think I think a lot of people think that, oh, business, a lot of money. You know, our, our business, sustainable income. No, just the fact that they were created. OK, uh, a lot of people created businesses because they didn't have a job. You know, people got laid off. You know, people, you know, you know, a lot, a lot of a lot of a lot of industries laid off a lot of employees. And some people live in more rural areas where they couldn't just walk or maybe make a short drive to to apply for another job. So at that time, their more the, the most sensible option for them was to create a business and hoping they can make some income online. Some of these people have some, some experience and may have been successful and other people haven't. But uh, I think that statistic that I, I, I see over and over on Fox News uh, uh, is, is, is worth shedding light on it because, uh, yeah, maybe, yeah, just because uh, the record history amount of businesses were created, it doesn't mean there has been profit margins. A lot of businesses fail. 
You know, if there was something you know, I, I've seen over and over something like seven, seven to eight out of 10 businesses fail. So maybe a person wanted to make a business so they can so they can make some income to take care of their family because they wasn't maybe they wasn't getting an assistance from the government or maybe it was delayed and he had bills they had to pay now. You know, the truth was, the truth is, you know, a lot seven, eight, seven to eight of out of 10 businesses, they fail. So uh, that's something to uh, keep in mind. All right, we're going to do it five more minutes. Any questions or comments? Don't be shy. Uh, uh, yeah, I, initially I was I was going to do this for like a half an hour, but as I said before, uh, knowing I I kind of have this, you know, I've always I, and I think what helps with the reason why my books resonated so well with people and the first book was the international bestseller is because I kind of have a teaching personality, you know, and sometimes I don't like to be too vague about things, I like to, you know, expound upon things and give detail. So, uh, yeah, that's kind of the that's kind of the uh, the teacher the teacher uh, ending. Um, but yeah, a call. Okay, four minutes. Yeah, four minutes. Any questions or comments? Uh, don't be shy. Okay, so all right. So as far as the YouTube channel, uh, if you're watching this, I advise you to uh, subscribe. Uh, if you haven't already, if you watched a few videos. Yeah, just 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 hit that button. Just subscribe. Click on the bell notification. Click on the bell so you can get notifications of, of my weekly videos. I uh, do videos every week, and um, and um, I hope uh, you know. Since is nowadays, even in Mexico, uh, where where uh, uh, can't say it. You know, there's a lot of uh, re- there's 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 less restrictions than in the United States, but Still, more people are not incur- a lot of people are not encouraged to go outside because of the pandemic. And if you do go outside, you have to wear a mask, and that's a whole other story. But um, so as a result, you know, I've been uh, I've been inside more. Uh, I haven't been speaking. I, have, I, have, I haven't did a public speaking appearance in a while. Uh, not because I don't want to, but because uh, I think the the COVID uh, played a significant factor in that. Uh, and uh, also, as I said before, I'm working on the updated version of my first book. Uh, so this one's going to be called Reaching the Finish Line, The Practical Guide, Second Edition. OK, so uh, look out for that. I'm very, very excited about that uh, to, and to share that with you. <clears throat> Excuse me. All right. Well, you know, if there's no more questions, uh, or if there's no questions or comments, you know, I'm going to wrap it up here. You know, I'm very. It was it was a pleasure to be with you, and, and you know, and whether you're watching this live or you want to, or you're watching this after this has already been uh, uploaded to uh, or published to YouTube. I'm glad that you joined me. Uh, it's my intention for you uh, to reach the finish line. Uh, since the Great Recession, I've helped over thousands of people reach the finish line. And that's what I want for you. You know, I've written two books. And I definitely want to do more. And and I'm I'm using this YouTube channel as a way to be able to uh, connect with you uh, more. But I just want you to remember that no matter how old you are. okay, doesn't matter what your race is. Uh, no matter what your background, you know, whether you came from the ghetto or you came from, you know, a low middle class mining town in West Virginia, like it doesn't matter where you come from, doesn't matter who you are. The truth is you can start reaching the finish line, whether you're 25 or 52, okay? Whether you're 37 or 73, you can reach the finish line. And that starts with taking the first step. And that's something that you can start tomorrow or preferably today. And that's what I want for you. The finish line is different for everybody. 
Okay. I don't know what your aspirations are, you know, but the truth is you can start by taking the first step. Okay. Callan Diggs here. Um, I don't know how often I want to do these live streams, um, but uh, I want to, I'm going to try to strive for maybe once a month, but uh, to, until then post a comment and we'll continue the conversation there. Okay. Talk to you later.